Joining us tonight in the nest is Dr. Bernice A. King. What an honor to speak with you today. You're, of course, continuing your parents' legacy with the King Center, and you guys have an immersive online experience, Nonviolence 365. I was reading a little bit about it. It's a super interesting initiative. Tell us about that and what you've kind of been doing to get that work there. You know, back in 1964, um, uh, when my father uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize, he gave a lecture as well. And in that lecture, uh, he stated that I suggest that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence immediately become a subject of study and serious experimentation in every field of human conflict, by no means excluding conflict uh, or relationships between nations. And so with that in mind, um, it has been our intention to ensure that that <laughs> comes to pass, that uh, it becomes a subject of study and serious, serious experimentation by people in all fields of human endeavor. And so we set out to create what we did uh, or what we do in person online so that anybody across the world can have access to how nonviolence influenced Dr. King and how it was utilized to bring about uh, social change in our society. But what most people don't realize is that nonviolence is not just something that people utilize in a social justice movement. Daddy really was saying that it is a way of life. That's the way he saw it. That's the way he lived it. That's the way my mother lived it as she started the uh, King Center. The purpose was to really help uh, future generations understand how nonviolence drove their, their, their actions, their words, and their engagement. And so this is an opportunity for people to come online at their own pace uh, to learn about what nonviolence is. Because when I first tell people, you know, it'd be good for you to take the nonviolence, they say, well, I'm not violent. And I said, well, you will soon discover that violence is more than just physical. And so we take people through that process. What is conflict? How do you distinguish between conflict and violence? You know, how do you help to de-escalate so that conflict does not become either verbal violence or physical violence? Uh, and then we talk, of course, about the history of how he utilized his philosophy and methodology, which are the principles and steps of nonviolence in all of the different campaigns. Um, there are, and then we take them through the six principles and steps and their exercises, um, and their, their um, scenarios that people are presented with real life scenarios that they go through from workplace to home to community uh, to see how to apply uh, nonviolence, uh, these principles and steps of nonviolence to all kinds of situations, conflict situations of violence, etc. Because the goal is to really spread this, as Daddy said, across the world. Uh, uh, number one, because it's needed <laughs> and necessary. There are ways uh, for us to create a much more humane world, and nonviolence is that way. But secondly, because he uh, talked about it with my mother as being the pathway to the beloved community. You know, when you talk about a just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world, how do we get there? You know, what are the, what are the uh, methods? What, what is the foundation for us uh, driving ourselves towards that kind of world? And so this is an opportunity for everybody, no matter what your uh, uh, area, profession, no matter, you know, uh, what you do in life, uh, to come online and do it, at, as I said, at your own pace at thekingcenter.org uh, or the King Institute, uh, dot org, uh, And it's reasonably priced uh, and there's no rush, but we've had all kinds of testimonies uh, from this uh, online experience, of course, through nonviolence as well that we've done in person. But specifically recently, a young lady who's an executive with um, JP Morgan Chase went through the course and her husband said, um, what what are you what do you own <laughs> like what are you taking <laughs> and she said what do you mean she said um i'm on dr king's nonviolence." <laughs> so uh it is a prescription to address so many things and, and change the dynamics uh in the way we relate to each other uh one of our trainers uh a gentleman who used to be a captain in the st louis police force said it literally saved his marriage um so that is uh, what this online is experience is about, and I hope people will, will log on and take advantage of the experience. Absolutely. I mean, that is just 
such an important tool. I, I love how you're talking about it in, in more ways than maybe just what people think this is. And so for you kind of talking about the King Center and the impact that it's had, not just on you, but with the Atlanta community, I think as a whole too, what does it mean to you to continue to pour into the King Center? Well, it means a great deal, first of all. Um, number one, because it is the official uh, living memorial to the life, work and legacy of my father. Uh, but more importantly, it's, it's the institution that my mother poured her life into. Uh, that she felt was important to establish so that future generations uh, would really understand and study Dr. King, his leadership and um, his nonviolence. And, um, you know, and so for me, it's been about uh, continuing her legacy more than anything else. I tell people all the time, you know, when my father was assassinated, he was one of the most hated persons in America. And now today, He's one of the most, most loved persons in the world. But why is that? I mean, you can say because when people die away, they're not as much of a threat. And I've heard that before. But the reality is it's because my mother spent an enormous amount of time pouring her life into making sure the work that they did during the movement continues to live and be somewhat institutionalized in, in our society. And so to me, it's very significant uh, to, to pour into this legacy. It is still needed, as I said earlier. Um, and um, even if I were not in the position that I am in currently, I would still be doing it. I've been doing it, you know, all my life, basically. I've been associated with the institution as a board member. I've been a part of leading some of the student uh, conferences when I was much younger um, and, and involved in many of the trainings and, and other things. And so, uh, the King Center to me is a very important historical and, and current um, uh, institution that our city, the state, and the nation really need. You also recently co-authored a new children's book, It Starts With Me. What message do you want kids to draw from this and even their parents that are maybe reading it to them? Well, you know, it. <laughs> I mean, uh, not to be rhetorical, but it does. It, it starts with me, Bernice A. King. You know, it starts with you, Kelly Price. It starts with you, Tori. Is it Mac Elman? Elman? McElhaney. <laughs> McElhaney. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, when, when people look at the world, there's a tendency, especially as a young person, you know, to think, hey, my parents, the adults, you know, if the world's going to change, it's, it's the adults, you know, that are going to do it. But really, when we have seen change, not just in our country, but in other nations across the world, when we've seen movements, it's been uh, comprised of young people. Um, Birmingham, for instance, here in the United States of America in the 60s, you know, part of the reason that there was a great awakening during the 60s, 63 specifically, in Birmingham because there was such young children out there, you know, basically wanting to uh, say, look, we want to be able to go to the parks. We want to be able to go to water fountains. We want to be able to go to public places and not be denied entrance because of the color of my skin. And these young people were as young as eight years old. And so I have always felt it was necessary that we put things in forms that young people can understand. And so we decided to do this book because we started this campaign at the King Center called Be Love. And we said, how do we make sure children aren't left out? What better way than to craft a book? So we brought it together and created a character off of the, the name Love, Amora, and her name is Amora. Um, and Amora is taking young people on a journey uh, to teach them how to open their heart and mind, to let love drive their words, their actions, and their thoughts, to understand that love is kind, you know, that love can stop hate, that love can help you to be strong and to rise up against, you know, what's ugly, what's, what's hateful, what's wrong, what's unjust, um, that love is a force that really can change our world. And, um, you know, it really, truly was also inspired by something that um, I often heard in my home growing up, my mother used to always say, somebody has to cut off the chain of violence. And of course, as a kid, when you hear the word somebody, that's not you. She was, she was talking about somebody else, I guess. Uh, but as I got older, I understood what she was saying is, Bernice, you have to be the one to start it. If it's going to change, if we're going to stop the violence, if we're going to stop the meanness, 
We can't be mean back to people. We have to find ways to let love transcend that ugliness and cause us to speak something different in the atmosphere. So that's why this book was written. And um, it has been um, very attractive, as you said, for parents even. I mean, I've had older, <laughs> older people, uh, adults buy it. And I'm like, why are the adults buying it? But it's a, it's a really beautiful book. I just want to show it here. It's a really beautiful book. This is the front of it. And this is the back of it. And so we have a pledge inside for kids to say the pledge and then sign their name on that pledge. I love that. I love that there's also kind of that call to action. Like you said, kids kind of <laughs> need that sometimes. Um, well, so obviously it's election season. Um, Atlanta, obviously a huge, uh, you know, kind of battleground state here in Georgia. How busy are you in the King Center right now during this season? Well, let me just say this. For us, it's about being proactive year round. You know, citizenship education and, and civic education is so desperately needed um, in our society today. And so we are always trying to keep people aware of what's going on. In fact, before we got to the actual time period, you know, of the, these different um, elections, uh, we were talking about the Voting Rights Act through our beloved community talks. You know, obviously we do a lot through social media, um, but we, we have, we've partnered with several organizations because it's not our direct work. Um, we, so we partner with organizations who, who are doing kind of the on the ground work, um, community organizing around um, uh, voting and voter awareness. Uh, we have um, an individual that uh, works, excuse me, with those, those organizations. So most of our work is through those networks um, as well as the, the work that we do via uh, social media, but also, as I said, making sure that people understand it's more than just this election. It's more to it than voting. Voting is one aspect of our citizenship engagement. You know, we have to understand what's going on, you know, in terms of laws and policies uh, that, that are, you know, on the table that people are discussing because we know there's a lot that's been going on lately. Um, and a lot of it is because people are disengaged. Um, and so our role is to say, hey, this is important. This, you know, legislation affects all of our life, uh, every aspect of our lives. Um, and so we want people to understand that. And so, sometimes we um, will have beloved community talks just to kind of break down what a piece of legislation is. You know, when SB 202 passed here in Georgia, you know, we had a beloved community talks to help people understand it because you got to you got you got to talk through all the noise that you may hear on media or even social media. And so it was an opportunity for us to heighten the awareness. So that's a large part of our work when it, in terms of awareness and education. Now, something that Kelly and I love to ask about on this show, because we are an Atlanta Bay show. We're two people that live in Atlanta. We love this community for you. What does the city of Atlanta mean to you and your family and just your personal continued mission for inclusion and justice and equality, not just in our country, but in our own backyard in Atlanta? Well, when you talk about justice, inclusion and, and equity, um, you know, Atlanta is kind of the heartbeat for that, you know, um, you know, we have always kind of, you know, <laughs> We've prided ourselves on being, you know, ahead of the curve to a certain extent of getting in front of things. Um, that's why Birmingham didn't become the economic engine of the South back in the 50s and 60s, because Atlanta understood, you know, that if, if we're going to grow and progress as a city, then we can't involve ourselves in these kind of racist and discriminatory practices. Not that Atlanta didn't have any, uh, but they had a community that rallied together uh, black and white at that time uh, to deal with those pressing challenges um, and help to overcome the stigma that often associated itself with the South. So that's the first thing. The second thing is my roots are here. You know, it's not just my daddy. My my great grandfather was uh, a founder of the local chapter of the N NAACP. Um, A.D. Williams. He was the pastor, the second pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church for 37 years. My grandfather was an activist, helped to um, integrate the elevators downtown, um, 
And, and uh, I forgot to mention this, my great grandfather fought for the opening of the first black public school, Washington High School, which his grandson would later attend, Martin Luther King Jr. and, and his grand, other grandson, A.G. Uh, Williams King, and also a granddaughter, Christine King Ferris, who's still living today, my father's sister. Um, and then, of course, we know everything that my mom, my dad did, and, and my mom. And so I call this, you know, a legacy city for me. Um, and with the King Center being here uh, and the work that my mother did uh, in this city to preserve uh, that neighborhood. You know, 1966, she went to Mayor Ivan Allen uh, because they were slated to do a demolition in the Auburn Avenue area, which would have included my father's home. And my father was still living at the time, but she took it upon herself to go visit the mayor and was able to stop that demolition. That's why we have the King birth home today um, and, and why some of the homes around there were preserved and why we have some other preservation places also on Auburn Avenue. And so to me, it's important um, that I stay, you know, tied and connected to, to Atlanta and continue this great legacy, you know, of justice, equity and inclusion. Um, because we got a lot of work to do in that regard. You know, we are a human family. I can't say that enough. It doesn't mean we don't recognize our distinctions, our, you know, our different cultural distinctions, you know, and backgrounds, but we're connected to each other. And, and I think that's something that Atlanta is constantly wrestling with and understanding and trying its best uh, to, to be a leader in that regard. And I want to be uh, in a city that is a leader in that respect. And I feel like the sports teams in Atlanta have done a good job of also kind of continuing that oh, goal, yeah. continuing that mission. Um, what role do you think sports teams can play in that, especially the Falcons, you know, what they're doing to better the community? What role can sports play in continuing that mission? Well, you, you and I know, everybody knows, when you think about sports, it's the one thing with music that unifies people. Regardless of our differences, you know, <laughs> you know, the sporting events, everybody shows up, you know, music events, everybody shows up. I was with a friend of mine the other day uh, at a Falcons game and um, she, uh, <laughs> she, she remarked while we were riding down the street after the game, you would not know that there's racism in our society. You know, when you see all of these people pouring out of the stadium and walking together on the street, you would just be like, really? We have a problem in our society? And so th that's the power of, of the sports arena. But more importantly, it's the platform um, that these sports teams have all over our nation. Um, they have the ability to uh, heighten a message um, in a way that is not tainted, you know, it's, it doesn't have to have the biases in it, you know, and it doesn't have to be driven by ratings, you know, we got to get our ratings up, you know, on whatever news station, um, they can just, you know, do it from a pure place. And, and so I think it's very important and, and they're cultural influencers, those who play in those different arenas are cultural influencers, and many of them come from the communities that we're talking about overcoming some of the uh, oppressive conditions, the impoverished conditions, the in, inequitable conditions. Uh, and so there's a sensitivity uh, that is there uh, with uh, many of these uh, players. And obviously there's a lot of money. I mean, change comes through resources, human resources and financial resources. Uh, and so I think it's, it's, it's so important and thank God uh, that the people who are part of these teams, whether, you know, it be the owners or the players or the, uh, the rest of the, the, uh, the, um, what do y'all call them? The, um, um, I'll just say the rest of the, the, the team, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, understand that, you know, this is so important and have decided to not just see you know, at one point, yeah, it was just about the football. You know, it was just about basketball. You know, it was just about the sports. But now, because of what has happened by many of the players and what has happened by those who, you know, were operating under the banner of Black Lives Matter, there's a greater consciousness now to understand that although we, you know, we're here to entertain people, we also have a responsibility to give back and to bring impact in the communities where we 
where we situate ourselves. And so that's 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 a wonderful thing. And, and it, it gives all of us an opportunity to partner with them because everybody, regardless of what industry we're in, which regardless of what field we're in, everybody has got to weigh in and be a part of what my mother called the freedom struggle. She said, freedom is never really won. And she said, so excuse me, she said, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And so that means we all have to participate in the generation where we have the strength to participate. Uh, to continue that freedom struggle, to make a difference, to bring about justice, equity, um, and bring about peace uh, in our nation and in our world. Absolutely. And an advice that I hope everyone takes from this interview. Now, before we let you go, we have to ask, because we are a football <laughs> show, we are a in football show. Please tell us a little bit, um, maybe one about one of your favorite memories as a Falcons fan or just kind of consuming Falcons football over the years. Now, you know, I'm going to get this wrong and y'all are going to shoot me later. But anyway, that's fine. <laughs> y'all are going to get me later. Uh, but when I was able to pull the... Come on, y'all hear me. The horn. Oh, the train horn. The horn. The, the train, train horn. horn. <laughs> oh! It was such energy and excitement <laughs> in the stadium. And so that was uh, that was one of the best days uh, that year. I think that was last year, I want to say, or the year before last, uh, right when the pandemic hit. Uh, and so, yeah, that was probably my most favorite memory. Love it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that would be everyone's favorite memory. That is awesome. That's so exactly. cool that you got to do that. I love it. Uh, but let me tell you something. The other, awesome. Let me tell you what, what superseded that, but it's not a Falcons thing. And that's why I didn't say it, but I'm going to say it here. Is when I was in the stadium, uh, the, the, the stadium where the Falcons played, their home field. When I was on that field and I flipped the coin at the beginning of the Super Bowl, that was my most favorite moment. <laughs> that is pretty cool, too. Wow. In my hometown, oh my yes. That is amazing. I didn't know you did that for the Super Bowl. I that did. is so incredible. Wow. Yes. Back was wow. that 2018? Well, I have, I yeah. Think it was 2018. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have nothing to top that. I have nothing to top that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing those memories with us. We really appreciate it. Anyone who wants to catch the full conversation, lots of really good stuff in there um, with Dr. King. Go to uh, fox5atlanta.com. We'll have the full thing posted on there. Thank you so much for the time. What an honor Thank getting to speak with you. Um, thanks for the time. And we'll, we'll be right back on Rise Up tonight.